Rotary and our partners are feeling cautiously optimistic about eradicating polio in the near future. Why are we optimistic? I've got four reasons. The first one is we've still got only but two countries that, uh, in which polio is endemic, Pakistan and Afghanistan. <clears throat> in Pakistan, it's been over a year since there have been any cases of polio. And in Afghanistan, only four cases last year, and only one case so far in 2022. The environmental samples that are taken from uh, the water in these regions are, show that the um, virus is in decline. There are very low um, uh, results coming from the water uh, samples. And in 2022, the World Health Organization uh, has restated its strategic plan that it will fulfill its promise to the world's children to eradicate polio. There are some big challenges, though, uh, not least of which is reaching children in remote areas, especially when uh, eight healthcare workers were killed last year uh, whilst giving um, polio vaccines to uh, children in Afghanistan. And huge refugee movements across Eastern Europe is going to make vaccination incredibly difficult there. So we, we are cautiously optimistic, and there are some challenges to get over. Of course, Dr. Bruce Aylward, who was the polio lead for the World Health Organization um, and a, a Newfoundlander that I'm sure many of you know, he said, we are dealing with the tail end of a large eradication effort, and this is when the virus will do all it can to depress, demoralize, and derail you. Are you as committed to its extinction as it is to surviving? Well. I can tell you there's one person in this room who is committed to its extinction, and that is Bruce Templeton. And I am honored to be able to present Bruce with the Regional Service Award for a Polio Free World 2022. Bruce, would you come up and receive the award? Bruce's amazing efforts for the eradication of polio. This award is actually for advocacy and non-financial uh, contributions to the eradication of polio. And of course, we all know that Bruce not only does the advocacy, but does incredible work through raising money for polio eradication as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Anything that I do is a team effort. And uh, everything that I do, I do with Paula. The, uh, all of my Santa activities. There's the lady behind the beard. She's wonderful to work with. Thanks for joining us today, Alex, and congratulations, Bruce. Um, what an incredible honor and well-deserved. So, well done. <laughs> and well done to Paula, too. Mrs. Claus. <laughs> um, so it is my honor to welcome Her Honor today to Rotary again. As you all know, Her Honor is very much a friend to Rotary and to our board and our executive. And whenever we need something done, she is more than accommodating and often gives us more than we ask for. So we're, we're absolutely delighted to have you back as what we can only describe as a friend to Rotary and not, not also our honorary uh, member as well. Um, Her Honor was born in Grand Back, Newfoundland. So good Newfoundland Bay girl. <laughs> Prior to serving in politics, her honors taught in the school in Grand Bank and in St. John's before working in television journalism with CBC's public affairs program here and now. Was the director of university relations with Memorial University and the director of communications for the office of the premier of Newfoundland and Labrador. Her, her honor was a member of the House of Assembly of Newfoundland and Labrador, re re representing the district of Grand Bank for 11 years. She served as Minister of Development and Rural Renewal, Ministry of in, Minister of Industry, Trade and, and Technology, Minister of Education, Min, Minister of Industry, Trade and Rural Development. That's a mouthful. 
In 2008, Her Honour was elected as a Member of Parliament, representing the riding of Randon, Bure and St. George's, and was re-elected again in 2011. She served as Deputy House Leader and Whip. In October 2015, Her Honour was re-elected to the new riding of Bonavista Bure and Trinity. On November the 4th, 2015, she was named to the Federal Cabinet as the Minister of Public Services and Procurement Canada and Receiver General of Canada and held this position until taking a leave of absence in April 2017 to be with her family. In August 2017, Her Honour announced her retirement as a Member of Cabinet and a Member of of Parliament to be in home, at home in Newfoundland and Labrador. <coughs> Contributing to the community has always been a priority for Her Honour. She is a mentor for cancer patients and has volunteered with the Girl Guides of Canada, the Heritage Foundation of Newfoundland and Labrador, the organization currently known as the Vera Plin Society, and the United Nations Children's Fund. Her Honour and her husband, His Honour, Howard Foote, have three children and four grandchildren. Welcome back. We're delighted to have you. Need I say how good it is to be back in person, uh, to have an opportunity to be in your company and to see so many familiar faces. And of course, I have an inside track when it comes to what's happening um, in Rotary. Uh, Linda Bidgood happens to be one of my aide-de-camps very capable, committed, dedicated aide de camp, so thank you. And of course, I have someone who's very close to me, who's a Paul Harris fellow, who keeps me abreast, particularly about your auction. And uh, last year, your auction cost me close to $1,000. <laughs> but I have this most beautiful piece of stained glass hanging in my house. And uh, so thank you to, uh, to Carla. Happy spring. I don't know how many of you, when you walked out of your house today, felt that spring was finally here, but then we all know about Sheila's brush. So just enjoy today, not knowing what tomorrow will bring. Every morning, I leave Government House and uh, I walk downtown. And that's how I get my exercise in before the day starts. And uh, so this morning, when I walk downtown, um, there are five homeless people uh, who I support uh, in downtown St. John's. Now, I don't have money for them every day, but every Friday I make sure I'm wearing something that I can put money in the pocket. And uh, one of the gentlemen, you've probably all seen him, um, on Duckworth Street, just up from the shoe hospital. So when I give him his money, he always says, are you sure that's a lot of money? And I said, well, no, because, you know, the cost of living today, all I want you to do is buy some healthy food. However you spend the rest, I don't care. But just feed yourself. Oh, yes, yeah. So he said to me, one day he said, what's your name? I said, my name is Judy. I said, what's your name? I mean, he has no idea what I do for a living. And I said, what's your name? He said, Jack. I said, hi, Jack. He said, you wouldn't say that on an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> well, I laughed because I thought, I hoped I was giving you a lift today. You actually just made my day. But he's uh, an amazing man. He was involved in the mining industry and got hurt. And now he's on the street. He has a home to go to, but he is uh, pretty destitute. Anyway, again, thank you for the invitation to be here, uh, to deliver what should be and could be, if it wasn't for COVID, an annual address to Rotary by the Lieutenant Governor. And I got to start by saying how impressed I was to learn about the club's multi-year focus. And as I said at the outset, I have inside information about all of that. So, um, But establishing the Veterans Care Project, the objective of which is to close the gap in care many veterans face as they struggle with physical and mental health issues, the rising cost of living, and for some, homelessness. So congratulations. As Rotarians, it is clear that each of you know just how important it is to make a difference in the lives of others and lead by example. As the Queen's representative in Newfoundland and Labrador, I have the opportunity, and I'm delighted to do so, 
to share with you and talk about the leadership of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, particularly given this is a monumental year as she is celebrating the Platinum Jubilee. Her Majesty has ruled for longer than any other monarch in British history, becoming a much loved and respected figure throughout the world, including outside of the Commonwealth. Her Majesty was just 25 years old when her father, King George, passed away. She was in Kenya when she received notice of his death. As a young woman, this moment immediately changed the trajectory of her life. She left London as a princess and returned preparing to ascend the throne as queen at 25 years old. Now, almost 70 years later, her extraordinary reign has seen her travel more widely than any other monarch, including to Newfoundland and Labrador, and I'm sure some of you who here will remember her visits. She's been to our province several times. In 1959, Her Majesty and the late Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, visited the province as part of a Canada-wide tour. In 1978, her visit included several functions, including planting a tree on the grounds of Government House as well as turning the sod for what became the Queen Elizabeth II Library at Memorial University St. John's campus. And in 1997, Her Majesty was here for Newfoundland and Labrador's 500th anniversary of the landfall of John Cabot. She joined residents in Bonavista as a replica of Canada's ship the Matthew sailed into the harbor. It was a pretty cold day. I can remember it today because you can still feel the chill. And, uh, but she was such a good sport, wrapped in a shawl of sorts, and, uh, but really did have to feel how cold it was. And it was really interesting because, of course, you have to present your credentials uh, to Her Majesty before becoming the Lieutenant Governor. And when we chatted with her, we were, His Honor and I had about 35 minutes with her, uh, and it was like, I'm not really nervous or stressed out over anything. I do what has to be done, you get the job done, and you move forward. I was stressed out about meeting her. <laughs> to get the curtsy down properly, don't put out your hand unless she puts out her hand, don't make eye contact unless she makes eye contact with you, remember to move one foot aside so his honor can come up and do his bow. I said, I'm gonna screw this up. <laughs> and uh, anyway, it went fine, and uh, before we, went in to meet with her, there were two ambassadors who uh, were going in ahead of us, and they were in and out in 10 minutes. So I said to his owner, this will be a breeze, we'll just get in and get out. We were in there with her for 35 minutes. She knows everything there is to know about you before she meets with you. Of course, she's so well briefed, and uh, we had a wonderful chat, and she remembered being here, particularly for the 500th anniversary, because she could remember the iceberg that dwarfed the narrows of the harbor. Do you remember that? And uh, so we had, a, we had a grand chat with her, and of course, you always take a gift when you go to visit Her Majesty. Now, what do you take? <laughs> a woman who has everything. So I thought, okay, I'm Newfoundland and Labrador. I'm all Newfoundland and Labrador. So I went down to Nonia and bought uh, a lap blanket. I don't know about you, but as I get up in age, when I sit, I like to cover my lap with a blanket. So I thought, you know, at her age, 93 at the time, she must like a lap blanket. So we bought her one made of Newfoundland tartan. And attached to that were the words of uh, the Ode to Newfoundland. So I thought, I'm going to let her know that we're the only province in Canada that has its own anthem, which she didn't know. So anyway, after sitting there for about 30 minutes, she looked at me and she said, I see you brought gifts. <laughs> and I said, we did. So she said, well, let's go have a look. So we went over and I explained the, uh, the tartan, the Newfoundland tartan, and explained the anthem and the words to the anthem. But I'd also bought a pewter pin from the rooms of the forget-me-not. And I thought, on this visit, I need to do what I'm always inclined to do, and that is educate. So I explained to her that in Newfoundland and Labrador, we're very proud Canadians, but on July 1st, we don't celebrate Canada Day until noon, because for us, it's Memorial Day. And the forget-me-not 
is to remind us of all of the brave young men who went to war. And I thought, I don't know if she will ever wear that forget-me-not, but she was, she was really taken with the story about the uh, Royal Newfoundland Regiment and all of the very young men who went af off to war not really knowing what they were getting themselves into. And of course, if we look at the situation in Ukraine today, and again we think of those young men who are, have to fight, and while the women and children are allowed to leave, the men who are of fighting age must stand, stay behind. So it's, when we talk about Her Majesty and, and her visit, and the, and the Platinum Jubilee, um, there was a rumor that there could be a royal tour during the Platinum Jubilee. So I thought, mm, a rumor. So I thought, let's find out. Let's make the request. If you don't ask, you don't get. So I was really interested in if Prince Charles was going to be doing a royal tour. So I did a little bit of research and found out that the last time he was here, because I know by a tree planted on the grounds of Government House, that it was in 2009. But he had been to the other Atlantic provinces since then. So I took it upon myself to write to Clarence House and to write to the Prime Minister, who would have a decision and a say in if the tour was going ahead, where it would happen. So I decided to write Clarence House and, uh, and make the request. And all I said was, you know, I, there's a rumor about a royal tour. Uh, I want to let you know that uh, if it's Prince Charles, we'd love to have him in Newfoundland and Labrador since he hasn't been here in 2009, but he's been to the other Atlantic provinces. So if he's coming east, he must come here. The, I don't know how many of you know that Nonya was actually started at Government House. Now, that's an amazing organization. You all know about Nonya. And Nonya was started at Government House by Lady Harris and carried on by Lady Alderdice. And of course, at that time when it was started, it was because we had so many young men going into war. And they needed woolen whatever to keep them warm. So whether it was socks, whether it was pants, whether it was whatever, um, Nonya was there. So we had a lot of women throughout Newfoundland and Labrador actually knitting for Nonya. And if you read the book on Nonya, the first 70 years, and remember now we were a British colony, a lot of the products that were knitted by these women in rural Newfoundland and Labrador were given to Her Majesty. Because of course Lady Alderdice and Lady Harris wanted to make sure that the Queen uh, knew about the rural Newfoundland and Labrador women who were not only knitting products to sell so that they could provide for their own self, but at the same time taking care of the soldiers from Newfoundland and Labrador. So if you see this book, Nonya is allowed to use the language as supply to Her Majesty. Nonya has that right to use that language. So I got interested thinking, okay, if they were providing sweaters and whatever to Her Majesty, there's a very good chance that Prince Charles wore a sweater knit by one of the women in Newfoundland and Labrador. And sure enough, in working with Nonya, they have replicated the sweater. So my take on all of this was there has to be a way to bring Prince Charles and Nonya together. So there's something called the Campaign for Wool. It's in 13 countries. It's an initiative of Prince Charles. And he's all about sustainability. He's all about the environment. So the Campaign for Wool in Canada, the CEO is Matthew Rowe. So I reached out to Matthew um, and said, have you heard of Nonya? No, Your Honor, I have no idea what Nonya is. I said, well, do I have a story for you? So I shared the history of Nonya with him. And I said, there must be an opportunity to bring Nonya together with the Campaign for Wool in Canada and see where it goes. So we've been working very closely with Nonya and with, uh, and with the Campaign for Wool Canada. 
so Matthew um, proceeded to tell me about uh, this piece of work that was done by an artist in Manitoba. And what it is, it's a bust of Prince Charles made of wool. It's an amazing piece of work. Now we have it at Government House. And we have it there because I said to Matthew, well, where is it? Oh, it's here in Ontario. Well, what's it doing in Ontario? He said, would you like to have it? I said, of course we'd like to have it. So Linda has seen it, of course. But it's an amazing piece of work. And there's a barcode that you can scan of the artist on YouTube explaining how it's made. So we had, uh, Matthew said to me, um, do you want to keep it? I said, I do want to keep it, at least for the, you know, if, if, if a tour happens, it'd be really nice to have it here. So he said, well, she's working on a bust of Her Majesty for the Platinum Jubilee. Would you like that? Of course we'd like that. So we're hoping to have that bust at Government House as well. But it is an amazing piece of work. And uh, whether or not Prince Charles will be here, uh, we've made the case. If you don't make the case, you don't get it. So we made the case to have Prince Charles here uh, during the Platinum Jubilee. And of course, along with Duchess uh, Camilla. So throughout you know, the extraordinary reign of Her Majesty, she continues to uphold public and voluntary service as one of the most important elements of her work. In fact, the Queen serves as a royal patron or president for over 600 charities. And I thought we had our hands full with 45. But she's absolutely amazing, and these are military associations, professional bodies, and public service organizations. So I have no doubt she would be so pleased with all of the work that Rotarians do. It's right up her alley. So we've got, uh, you'll be interested in this, Alex. I told you, you'd be interested in this. So speaking of the environment, which is really of interest to the royal family, and certainly to Prince Charles, I'm going to take a moment to speak about the Queen's Green Canopy. The Queen's Canopy is a unique tree planting initiative created to mark Her Majesty's Platinum Jubilee in 2022. People and organizations are invited to plant a tree for the Jubilee. And they're doing this throughout the Commonwealth, but of course, we're doing it on the grounds of Government House. The project encourages the planting of trees to create a legacy in honor of the Queen's leadership, and of course, the project itself will benefit future generations. Like the initiatives of Rotarians, the Queen's Canopy provides tangible results. So I put it out there, because I'll tell you how we're doing that. So the role as Lieutenant Governor representing the Queen presents many opportunities. Um, every LG comes into this role. Uh, two things you must do, and that those are constitutional. So for instance, all of the legislation that's passed and deba or debated and passed in the House of Assembly must come to the Lieutenant Governor for royal assent before it becomes law. The other thing, of course, are all the ceremonial events we do, like, of course, recognizing Tommy Howitt, uh, like uh, a lot of the organizations that I'm patron of, or his owner's patron of, um, holding events at Government House to recognize individuals, volunteers, or causes, and we do that regularly. Our schedule's quite full. But my take on this role was in addition to those two areas of responsibility, there has to be a way to make a difference. There really has to be a way to reach out and find different ways of doing things. And of course, finding different ways of doing things is really important during COVID. So the past two years have taken on a different approach to serving the people of our province as the Queen's representative. Being able to define the job was really important to me. Because again, the, you know, the constitutional ceremonial events are really important. But there's got to be a way to make a difference in the lives of others. And you know where Government House is located. It's downtown St. John's. We are surrounded by the most vulnerable people in our city. We opened up the grounds of Government House from dawn to dusk. 
And we did that because we wanted people to feel comfortable. And I can't tell you how many people, after we did that, and I would go out and people were walking the grounds, and I would say, it's so nice to see you here. And the immediate response was, are we allowed to be here? Because they never felt comfortable walking through the grounds of Government House. Now, I, I'm going to credit um, the Honorable Ed Roberts for really doing away with the invitations to the garden party and, and encouraging people. But I said, we need to set a time frame. We need to say, if you want to come through here in the morning, you can do it. If you want to come through uh, till dusk, you can do that too. Unfortunately, when you do those things, sometimes there's a, an outcome that is not what you had anticipated, so it warrants having to do something else. So if you're passing by Government House and you see that there are gates going up, it's not to keep people out. Um, but there's a tendency for people to take a shortcut to the grounds of Government House in their cars. So 11 o'clock at night or midnight, you can hear. And it's problematic because you have people walking, you don't want them getting hurt. So what we're doing is the, the security there will close the gates at dusk and open them at 6 a.m. the next morning so that people can continue to walk those grounds. We just have to be cognizant of the fact that if you have people going through in cars, that then people can get hurt. So we've got, we had to find different ways of doing things, particularly of COVID. Uh, of course, the house was closed. Um, staff were sent home. Uh, but I'm sitting there going, there's got to be a way of continuing to help. So of course, in our neighborhood is Stella Circle. So I reached out to Stella Circle to say, how can we help? Now remember, uh, the chef at Government House was home. So I said, how can we help? Uh, your clients and the idea was, I said do you need food yes your honor we really could use food because our clients had you know the numbers had increased with everything that was going on so I called Jerome and I said Jerome you don't have to do this but would you come in two days a week for several months and provide food to help out Stella Circle he did not hesitate he came in and every Tuesday and Thursday for four months we provided enough food, so we came in one Tuesday and would have gotten a whole large lasagna, another would have gotten a large pot of chili, whatever we could provide for them. And we did that for four months because it was important to do it. Other things we had to do differently, we want to recognize our arts community. Bear in mind that a lot of our artists um, had nowhere to perform. Having nowhere to perform meant no income. So how, how do we help? I'm a big supporter of the arts. It's our history, it's our culture. We should all be big supporters of the arts. So we did a, a, what's called the Patio Series. I don't know if you've ever heard of Brian Way, but he's one of the best pianists you're gonna find. So uh, Brian was doing a Patio Series off of his home. And uh, I wasn't aware of it until David Pomeroy, and I know David Pomeroy, he's the best. Uh, David called to tell me, he says, Your Honor, you should watch me on the patio series with Brian Way, and I said, sure. So I watched, and of course, I was blown away by it. Brian organized it all with his wife, Karina, and they would invite all of the talent to come. Nobody got paid. It was the profile they were getting, but it was also from a mental health perspective, an opportunity for them to engage, because many of them were not able to do so during, during COVID. So we did the patio series, Again, Brian would organize it all, and our only involvement was to provide the space. And when I said to Brian, would you like to um, use a patio of Government House? He said, I would love to do that. So of course, he speaks very briefly before he um, does the patio series. And there were days when he'd say, it's a delight to be here um, at my shed. It's a delight to be here at my castle. It's a delight to be here at whatever. He was just being really funny. and. Uh, but it was so good to have him because it helped him as well. Uh, we did a lot of live streams. So we did, again, sticking to a few people coming to Government House, we did a, a live stream with uh, Shelley Neville and Peter Halley. And when I say we did a live stream, um, on just on Facebook alone, we have over 18,000 followers from throughout the world. So while we weren't able to pay any of our performers, we were able to give them that exposure 
and the response was incredible to all of the live streaming. We also did the live stream with the Rowdy Men, um, and that was uh, always, again, well received. So I think that the thing for us was providing a venue. Uh, we did the lunchtime performance series on the grounds of Government House. Again, no money. You've heard me say many times we have no money at Government House. <laughs> you just have to find ways to make things happen. So we contacted the, uh, some of the artists, so um, Bernie Stapleton, uh, Amy House, to say, we have space. If you want to have a lunchtime performance series and you want to sell tickets on Eventbrite, go for it. And you get to keep all the money. Uh, we will just provide the space for you. And you just have people bring their chairs or their blankets and have a lunchtime um, opportunity to enjoy a performance. We started what's called the um, LG's Performance Series. And some people will say to me, well, why did you do that? Because I believe in the arts, and I think it's really important for us to take advantage of an opportunity to profile. One, our school of music, I don't know how many of you are familiar, but we have so much talent. Those students are absolutely amazing. So we instituted the LG's Performance Series at Government House, and we were working collaboratively with the School of Music, and they would identify the students who would come and perform. And it would just blow your mind. And the guest list was made of um, some guests who were supportive of the School of Music, so donors. Uh, it was a good way of recognizing them and thanking them for their donations. But we also uh, contributed to the guest list, finding people who may not be aware of the School of Music, but would benefit from hearing about it and hopefully become donors down the road. We did two with the School of Music before uh, COVID hit. And then of course we couldn't do them anymore because you're inviting people in to Government House. But now that we're back able to do it again, during Black History Month, and what I did, I'm, we're very much into social media and educating the public and making sure people are aware of what's happening. So during Black History Month, we profiled every day of February someone in our community who was black. And it was so well received. So that meant 28 people and or their families were profiled on social media. And the following was amazing. But you got to learn about the amazing immigrants here in Newfoundland and Labrador. So we did that during Black History Month. But the performance series was breathtaking. So working with Dr. Loidetta Cueco, I don't know how many of you know Dr. Cueco, she does uh, Sharing Our Cultures on Rogers, um, an amazing woman. She has the Order of Newfoundland and Labrador. Her contribution to our province has been superb. So I asked her to identify performers in the black community that we could feature at a LG's performance series, and she did. And the guests that were at that event, it was a highlight for them. We had um, the Black, Black Heritage Newfoundland Choir. And when they did Lean On Me, people were so impressed and so engaged. There were people there who I thought I'd never see move. They could barely sit. It was just a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And then we had uh, Ilsa, what's Ilsa's last name? She's a student at the School of Music, and she just dropped her single the next day. Incredible, incredible people. So now we're doing another LG performance series on April the 5th. Again, back to the School of Music, and they're providing the entertainment. But I just went to a vigil for peace in Ukraine at Topsail United. And it was an opportunity to participate uh, in recognizing the atrocities that are happening in Ukraine. And Reverend Kathy Brett is the, uh, is the minister there. But there that evening was Brian Truick, who's a folklore professor of Ukrainian descent. He has many family members still in Ukraine. He spoke about what is happening in Ukraine and the fact that 
they saw on the news when the first bombs were dropping that they had to call their family members and, and alert them to this because they had no idea. So he was talking and he was so appreciative, um, so appreciative of the support that Canada and other countries are giving to Ukraine um, and that Newfoundland and Labrador is giving, particularly now with the office in, in uh, Poland. Um, and he said, we need to have that support continue. So he said something that really stuck with me. He said, for $20, a family of four in Poland can be fed for a week. $20. And I said, Brian, you need to keep saying that, because I'm sure that everyone who has $20 in their pocket will donate it. And you can do it for, through any cause, the Red Cross, UNICEF, but that's the way. You know, I think we all, part of the human species, you know, if you're going to have faith in humanity, uh, how can you watch what's transpiring in Ukraine and not feel an obligation to help, uh, knowing that there's only so much we can do, but we can certainly spread the word. So Brian is a member of the Kubasonics I don't know if you've heard of the Kubasonics, an amazing Ukrainian band. Um, so we are hoping on April the 5th to start our LG's performance series with the Kubasonics and to have Brian speak too, very briefly, because we've got all of this talent lined up, but very briefly speak to what is happening in Ukraine and how we all need to recognize that this just didn't just happen this year. If you look at Russia's involvement in Europe, you can see that they've been under threat for many, many years. And just when they think that it's going to be OK, in comes Putin again. So some of the things that we continue to do, um, the sharing circles, you've heard me talk about them before. Um, we use sharing circles because it's really important to understand the importance of sharing, uh, but as well to uh, have circles that people can gather around like this. Because in Indigenous language, circle means healing, which is what we all should be trying to do, is learn from each other and find ways to healing. So we continue to do those, and I can tell you that the first one we did, we invited individuals and we worked with um, the Department of Health in the uh, mental health uh, section of the department. I'm not sure if that's what it's called. But they helped us bring together people who had either lost loved ones to suicide or could the next day. That's the situation in which they found themselves. And no social media around any of this. This was really just really important to do. And uh, I can tell you that that was very raw. That was very emotional. And uh, But what was really helpful for the participants was that they learned from each other and they became a community within themselves. They left with contact. They became that family who could support each other. The heart garden, you've heard me talk about the heart garden. That's our attempt at reconciliation because we all have a role to play in reconciliation. And I think the more we hear about unmarked graves, the more I talk to elders about what they experienced in residential schools, the more we need to be engaged in the Reconciliation Initiative. So the Heart Garden, please, if you haven't seen it, take time. It's a place of reflection. And I will tell you that the heart in the middle, that's, um, that was a form, concrete form, we had, and I'll tell you this too, the um, Rotary Club in Happy Valley Goose Bay. When I told them what we were trying to do, I said, I need a slab of Labradorite but I have no money. So they gave me enough money to buy a slab of Labradorite. And the heart on the top of that heart form was a work of art by Edmund Saunders, who's Inuit, whose sister was Loretta Saunders, who was murdered in Nova Scotia. So for Edmund, this was a labor of love. And if there's any way of closing a chapter like that in your life, that one certainly did. So I talked about the campaign for wool and the relationship between Nonia 
and how we're hoping that if we can get um, Prince Charles here, if there is a royal tour, the case has been made that a non will factor heavily in it. And on the grounds of Government House, because you will know Rotary has its own tree planted there uh, to mark your 100th anniversary, is a sculpture done by Morgan McDonald to mark the 100th anniversary of Nonia. So depending on the program, we put a program in place for consideration by the feds and by consideration by Clarence House. So Clarence House will be here next, or two weeks from now, I think it is. But we've already had a recce by um, Heritage Canada and the security people to see, you know, they just have to be careful because then what they present to Clarence House is what will become reality. So we were really, uh, we were really inc inclined to uh, get our ducks in order and make sure that uh, we were ready in the event that we should be fortunate enough to, uh, to have a future king come to the grounds of a government house or to Newfoundland and Labrador. So among all the things that we're doing, I, I would tell you, uh, I said every LG uh, comes into the role. You can come in with your own platform, however you want to make a difference. Some choose to do only what's required, and that's perfectly okay. They fulfill their responsibilities. For me, coming in, my platform was on mental health. Mental health and democracy, really important to me, as, as is physical health for obvious reasons. But I wanted the grounds of government house to be more than just a walkthrough in one gate and out the other. If you're going to benefit from that safe, beautiful environment, you need an experience. So that's what we've been working on. So you all know about the uh, yoga on the lawn, which I was told you can't do that because you represent Her Majesty. Uh, tai Chi Cha, wisdom healing, mindfulness, all activities that are free on the grounds of Government House for four months out of the year, that, headed by professionals who volunteer their time and talent. From there you go down to the heart garden, where you see um, all the plants there are plants that would have been used by our indigenous population for medicinal or uh, for food medicinal purposes or for food. You leave that and you go over to the Nonia sculpture. You leave that and you go down for equine therapy because the RNC are still on the grounds of Government House, thankfully. Um, so they have four majestic animals. Now, if you're either a bit nervous of large animals, you probably won't go near them, but they are amazing. So I thought, what about children? Like given COVID, not being able to be with their classmates, they're going through a tough time, as are many adults. And I've seen that just by talking to people on the grounds. And they well up when I say to them, you can be here anytime. You can spend as much time as you want to here. You know, you can read a book. You can just sit under the majestic trees. You can listen to the birds. So you go down to, for equine therapy, and we've added two Newfoundland ponies. And I did that when I suggested we do Newfoundland ponies. I said, it's our, our heritage animal. Why wouldn't we do that? <clears throat> But in terms of equine therapy for children and for some adults, those two Newfoundland ponies have become a godsend. So we talk about the commemorative Commonwealth Walkway. The province was asked to do, every province was asked to do a project for the platinum. And while well, my colleagues across the country were so impressed with our heart garden, they decided we're gonna do a heart garden. I said, but we've got the heart garden done. So what are you going to do? I said, well, we're going to do the commemorative Commonwealth Walkway. What's that? Well, on the north side of our 22 acres, north side of, of the grounds of Government House, we have 54 trees planted by dignitaries from our own monarchy, from other monarchies, from the governor's general, from lieutenant governors. Uh, we have a whole grove by premiers. Uh, you name it, we have it. But nobody ever walks because the ground is so uneven. So I said, we're going to do the commemorative Commonwealth Walkway. We'll do it in, 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 to commemorate Her Majesty's Platinum Jubilee, but it'll also make it possible for people to walk this commemorative Commonwealth Walkway and learn about our history and who planted the trees and why they were planted. And we're so into this, when, I, when we tried to sell this to the province, because again, we have no money, so we, <laughs> we ended up um, getting their blessing. So if you walk through the grounds now, you will see the walkway that's being 
And if, you're, if you've ever been dealing with contractors, you know that that should have been finished uh, before winter came. It wasn't, so now we're trying to uh, do it when the frost gets out of the ground so that if um, HRH comes for a royal tour, we'll be able to get him to do the inset and mark the, this initiative as an initiative of the uh, Platinum Jubilee. While we were doing that, by the way, digging up the grounds and making the, the walkway happen, Government House engaged with the Provincial Archaeology Office. Now hear this, as our grounds are a provincial and historical site, just as Government House is. When the assessment was carried out on the grounds, some notable features were discovered, including the location of the Garrison Hospital Foundation from 1805, as well as the remains of a barracks that would have supported an anti-aircraft battery during World War II. So we had to make sure that the walkway did not infringe on any of that for historical purposes. So it was really uh, what we were hoping to do. The um, annual general meeting of the Vice Regal family in Canada will take place September 17th to the 22nd here in St. John's. First time since I think Mr. Crosby hosted it, so that wasn't yesterday. And we are hoping to open, or officially unveil the walkway. And I've written to Her Majesty's private secretary to say, since she's doing so many things virtually, this will be a wonderful opportunity for her to join us for the official unveiling with her entire Canadian Vice Regal family present. So many of you have heard me talk about the greenhouse. So when you walk the amazing uh, commemorative Commonwealth walkway, it will take you past the greenhouse. Fingers crossed. I've managed to raise a million dollars just by word of mouth, and uh, we still need some more, but I'll get there. Uh, but it's been a quiet campaign. Word of mouth, word of mouth. People with money talking to people with money talking to people with money who believe in this initiative. So I want that walkway to take you past the greenhouse. And it's not just a greenhouse to supply what we need for the grounds of Government House. We are working with our neighbors, so with Stella Circle. We have just hired a horticulturalist. We've been trying to find one for two years. There's a shortage of horticultural technicians in Newfoundland and Labrador. So the clients of Stella Circle, while they're really appreciative of the money that's donated to them and to Stella Circle, I spoke with the CEO and I said, we want to do more. We want to help them become productive members of society. I said, so what we will do, we now have a horticulturalist on staff. If we can get them to work with us, uh, you know, helping with the planting on the grounds of Government House, learning a skill while they're doing it, then all of these jobs that are available that now they can't find anyone to fill, they can fill them. You don't need a university degree. You don't need a college education to be able to plant, to be able to. And then you go, once you acquire the skill, then you learn all about horticultural, uh, or horticulturalism. So we're in the process of um, working with Stella Circle, um, understanding what the needs are of Government House. But we're going to do programming in that greenhouse. And we're going to educate. And we're going to give them the opportunity to practice the skills of learning. And hopefully, these jobs that are available can be filled by those individuals, helping them become productive members of society, because we know that's what they want. They just not have, they have not had the opportunity. And then when we get the plants done and the grounds are done, food security. A wonderful greenhouse for us to start looking at Food First Newfoundland and make it a year-round operation so that we can um, supply some of the food that's needed. And we're also going to have community gardens so people can come in and, uh, and like Stella Circle, can come in and grow the, the product. So we've got a lot on the go. Um, one of the initiatives that's been really, really rewarding uh, for me, because again, it's all about education 
and that is the lighting of government house with LED lights. So if you cl live close by and you go by a government house and it's lit yellow, it's lit for cancer. And I'm all over social media, as I said initially, so all you have to do is go in on our page, our Facebook page, and find out why it's lit yellow or why it's lit blue. I had a woman who sent me a message and she said, would you like government house for Williams syndrome? I said, what's Williams syndrome? So she explained to me it's about um, the failure of your muscles to behave as they should. I said, sure we can. I said, I've never heard of it. So we lit the house yellow for Williams syndrome. The message from her the next day was, I brought my son by last night to see that the house was lit for him. Her son had Williams syndrome. Now she didn't tell me when she asked us to do this. But all I could think was the impact you can have just by doing one little thing. The idea of Government House for me is the importance of it being a part of the community so that people get to enjoy the grounds, people get to enjoy the house. We offer tours. Everything is free. Make no wonder we have no money. But <laughs> people get to participate and be a part of and understand that Government House and the grounds of Government House belong to them. So walk the grounds, have the experience, spend two hours at least on the grounds. And you know, I quote Hippocrates all the time, nature is the best physician. So bringing people to the grounds of Government House, having them take time to be there and enjoy it. As I said at the outset, my platform was mental health. Making sure that people have the opportunity. And of course with COVID, it's been hard on everyone. So thank you for the opportunity to get up here and go on and on about, uh, about Government House. I'm, uh, I'm so committed to making it uh, a place where Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, not just in St. John's, but throughout the province. When you come for a visit, if you come to, for a medical appointment or you come for business, come by the grounds of Government House. And I am determined, uh, as you can tell, to, um, to make a difference. And I think we're doing that, but I'm also determined to be accountable. So I've been there three years, my fourth year. I'll start my fifth year, which is my last year, uh, May 3rd. We have produced three annual reports. We'll have another one now the end of April. And it is because I believe in being accountable. And when I went to Government House and I said, how are we accountable? The question was, what do you mean? Well, how do we let people know that even though we don't have a lot of money to spend on things other than what's required, people need to know that we are accountable, that we're not just sitting there and just twiddling our thumbs. So here you are in your 101st year, uh, doing so many good things, making a difference in the lives of so many, not just in the province, but throughout the world. And I'm just so proud of what you do, particularly as an honorary member of your Rotary Club. Uh, but having this opportunity to share with you what we're doing was important to me too, because together we can make quite a difference in our province and in the world. So thank you so much for your time.
This program is brought to you by Ignite.